Okay, then let's get started. Um, thanks everybody for coming today. Um, I was just talking to Jonathan Rees, who's a software engineer for Creative Commons, and he was telling me that he was in the, he works on science, uh, scientific issues, um, and he was just telling me that he was in an open government session, and the technical problems anyway, that, or techno-social problems that they were facing in open government were exactly the same ones that he sees in open access. Yeah, but they were using different words and they don't know about the work that he'd been doing. And that made him sad. Um, and there needs to be better communication across those movements. Um, so really there are a bunch of commons movements. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this panel together is because I think they need to be talking more and sharing knowledge more and cooperating more. And I think it's particular relevance at this CC summit because we're figuring out our strategy for the next some years and creating the legal tool that's our main product that is going to serve the commons for you know, 10 plus years, I hope, because we shouldn't be doing another version anytime soon. Um, and I think that we need to, we being the Creative Commons community, need to take into account lessons from other commons movements as we're thinking about strategy and building version 4.0, and also think about how we can cooperate with other commons movements as we're doing doing these things. I mean, it, and uh, not, not only learn from movements directly, but also uh, deepen our understanding of commons theory, which I think ought to be informing our strategy and our tools. So I'm super happy with the panel that has assembled. Um, uh, starting with uh, Silka, who's a uh, leading uh, authority on the commons in general. Um, not just intellectual commons, but um, also commons involving tangible goods. And the history and movements around those. And then we have Leonard, who has written about both uh, Creative Commons and uh, Wikimedia as movements. Um, and we have Ting Ray, who's uh, been the lead of Creative Commons Taiwan for uh, basically the entire history of CC. So he has seen the Creative Commons movement from man's side and also is involved in free software. So also brings that perspective. Um, and then Kat Walsh, who is on the Wikimedia board, um, but is really a leading light of the Wikimedia movements, um, much more than um, as a board member. Um, so thanks again for coming. And I, and I think the way that we'll run this is we'll, we're going to have statements from each of them. And if there are pressing questions specific to a presenter, then we can take a couple minutes to take those, but what I really want to do is um, um, kind of generate a uh, discussion amongst us all after everybody makes their statements. So, thanks. Germany, I work with the Common Strategies Group. This is a small group of international activists. You may know um, Peter Bowens from the Peer to Peer Foundation or Michelle, I know this one, I guess, or um, David Bollier, who has written a lot uh, on the Commons, and, and you certainly know Beatrice Bucanice from the Latin American chapter of Creative Commons, so the four of us in the four continents. We try to, well, basically do what I'll present right now, the kind of make visible the connection between different kinds of commons, because as Erling Berger once said, each commons is one of the kind. Obviously I cannot present to you um, what the commons, global commons movement is all about. I guess it's just in a, in a stage of um, discovering its own identity. 
Uh, we are doing a book right now, a huge monograph on the Commons is about 100 authors from all over the world and I'm really happy that Mike contributes to as well, so we'll publish it next year and thanks again for the invitation. Here we go. What I want to share with you are three things. That, what is the key notion of the Commons? What is it all about? And how do I see right now, after having a sister to the two days of discussion and exchanged um, uh, points of view with, with Mike and, and other members of the board as well. How do I see right now the relationship between Creative Commons and that key notion of the Commons? And finally, I prepared a short wish list for Creative Commons from a communist perspective. So, here we go. What is this? In, in Boston, there is a ritual in winter time when the snow falls. People are allowed to shovel out parking lots and they put all chairs or boxes or bins or whatever in there. And so they are entitled to stay with this shoveled out part parking lots, lots until the snow melts. So what this actually is, this is a commons. That's not me. It's saying that, but it's Eleanor Ostrom, she won the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2009. As you certainly know, one of the most important researchers in the world on the commons. And I like this Boston chair parking lot example for the simple reason that it shows easily what a commons is all about. It might be long term or short term shared understanding of how to use something which does not belong to only one person, nor to only one nation. What is the something? The something is kind of everywhere. It's rival, non-rival, it's local, regional, global, and um, it's, it's the land and the water we share, the sunlight, the public spaces, the code, the genetic code and the digital code. So actually, when I stumbled upon the issue kind of um, seven years ago, the first question we asked, what do actually have the software and seeds have in common? And we realized that, well, as James Boyle showed in his fabulous essay on the second enclosure movement of the common, commons, we realized that um, they share a history of enclosure and they are both essential Seeds are the main instrument to produce food for people and software is today the main instrument to produce food for thought. So, if you share both seeds and software code, we are kind of creating the conditions to reproduce our livelihoods both in the natural sector and in the cultural sector. And why it is important, and what is it all about? This defense of, it's all about the defense of access, use rights, and control. And this clearly relates to the way Creative Commons approach the issue. It's basically, it has been all the time, for about 900 years now at least, a back and forth and back and forth defending the commons from enclosure. Well, ex ex actually, uh, one of the um, today legends in, in literature is Robin Hood. And it's not casual that when during the real lifetime of Robin Hood, what happened was the first enclosure of the forest so that commoners could not access anymore to the resources which by the time was the petrol for those and they started defending their access and use rights to forest resources just like we today defend our access and use rights to digital resources. Because enclosures as we know are going on here again we see kind of can do a kind of analogy between technical enclosure of access to cultural resources and technical enclosure of access to seeds. Don't know, maybe you don't know this um, 
So the last developments in, in the biodiversity discussion, do you know the GERDs? This technology which is able to switch off the basic function of the seed, which is to reproduce life. So you can manipulate seeds in such a way that they won't produce a new plant next year and you are forced to go to the market and buy it again. Which is basically the same thing as putting a technical device to protect people from access to um, coat. So it has all the time, for the last 900 or 1000 years, been community, community which is the core notion, one of the core notions of the commons, defending their freedom by making their own rules. That is what the commons is all about and what this guy, historian Peter Lango from the US calls commoning. He says there's no commons without commoning, which clearly shows that it's not about the resource, it's not about land, it's not about water, it's not about coat, it's not about seeds, it's about us and how we relate to each other. It's about our decision to produce our commodities or the commons. So, in short, commons are social, institutional, technological and legal innovations from bottom up. The creative function created such an innovation, such a new tool from bottom up. And now why is it so important to really strengthen the relationship between the broader commons movement and creative commons? Because Joy Ito said it yesterday, because the biggest value of the internet is the fact that we have only one internet. So it is key to do the right thing. So creative commons is the organization who created from bottom up a set of tools for one of the main instruments in the world to reshape social relationships. That's why. That's why it's really key to use this instrument to do the right thing. So what's the right thing then? For me, it's reproducing the commons. What is, and now we come to the second part, what is the relationship I see between the way creative commons does use its instruments today from a commons perspective. Those last two parts will be very short, so don't be afraid. Well, I learned yesterday, I saw before the internet, of course, that the mission of Creative Commons is to develop, support and steward legal and technical infrastructure that maximizes digital creativity, sharing and innovation. It sounds great, it's amazing, and obviously it is a goal by itself, so to say. But one wonders immediately more creativity sharing and innovation brought for and goes back to the vision, which says what for? It says driving a new era of development, growth and innovation. And that is interesting because if I compare the debates in the international commons movement. As I said, there are over a hundred authors contributing to our new book. It, it's really something that gives you a good idea of where are they at. They are surely not committed to growth and development in classical sense. Because growth is something that created the mess we are in in relationship to the natural resource use and so on and so forth. And the idea of development as we always, we always go right ahead from one point to another as a linear way is something which in the view of a lot of communists, especially in the South, belongs to the past. So again, I would ask the question, development, growth and innovation, what for? And I could not really grasp the answer yet here in the last two days. But what I really understood here is what Creative Commons is right now with respect to the commons. And I will put it in one sentence. It's the most important ambassador for the commons worldwide. Willingly or unwillingly, it's just labeled like this. So people will ask you, what is the commons all about? 
By the way, yesterday I asked two young people from the crowd, and I asked them the same question. Also, what is the conference all about? And one said, is this a relevant question? And the other said, I even don't want to know. That was um, surprising for me. Well, if one focuses on the ambassador's message, on the comments, one realizes that the ambassador's message is not focused on the comments. Therefore, I wish this time. And here we are at the very end. I would like creative comments caring for the long history of the term creative commons choose to label its international organization, which now is, as I said, the most important ambassador of the commons worldwide. And I would like creative commons caring for the very essence of protect and defend people's access and use rights and people's control over what's theirs shared collective resources in a natural, social and cultural sphere. Not because some state or entity gave it to us, just because we are commoners. Just because there are a lot of things in the world which do not belong to only one person, not to only one state. Second wish, I would like very much to be in Creative Commons aware of and that's why I'm so pleased with the invitation of the related commons movement and strengthening the relationships with those commons movements. And the third one, I would like creative commons focusing on what, on what I consider is the most important thing when it boils down to the instruments. How do we use the instruments created here in this wonderful organization? It should be used, in my humble opinion, for the self-reproduction of the commons. And it should be used for the self-reproduction of the commons because this is the condition for freedom for all. And not just individual freedom. So, oh, I will skip that. In short, be a steward. Stewardship is a very important notion in the international commons debate. There is no commons without commoning. There is no commons if there is no steward for collective resources. Therefore, be not only creative commons, be creative for the commons. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, when it, I, I suspect there might be a couple of questions before we move on to the other speakers. I have one question to start off with. What, what do you mean by self reproduction of the commons and, and how specifically do you see CC's uh, CC tools either facilitating or not facilitating them? When we were today in the session on OER, I learned that some of the people said that they started with. Um, CCY and then shifted to CCY SA. And they used a very logic argument for me because this is really this, this key the notion of the commons. The logic argument, even for public policies, is um, if there's public funding, if there's funding of our tech, if there's our taxpayers' money in there, access should be always open, it should be always be public. So I think the same idea is the idea of SA. If you take the basic idea is if you take out of the commons, you are in a certain way obliged to give back to the commons. So it is not just that's why I think we have to tie both purposes to each other. Take out of the commons and give back of the commons related to individual freedom. Because we basically think that and yes, I say we, because that is a notion you find all over the world. It just was in Thailand, it's the same thing. If you just have some Latin America about the Buen Vivir, the good life concept, it's the same thing. The basic notion is that my well-being depends on enhancing the well-being of others. So it's clearly a modern focus, not based on individual freedom, but on the reciprocity between individual and collective well-being. 
Do you have some uh, experience uh, common to all this movement of uh, enlarged movement of commons? I mean, for example, Fab Labs. It's also, I think, it's a it's a way also to consume uh, common goods and so on. So do you have? A, do you know some ex some institutes of research and program which uh, relates everything like that? Because we are very interested in that's what we do. Oh yeah, okay, I mean that's our job, that's what we try to do. Yeah, we uh, basically have a lot of colleagues in France. We did the first international commons conference last year in Berlin. Um, we brought people from 45 countries there. And the next publication just to try to focus on that. This Fab Labs, for instance, is really too. Fab Labs is certainly peer production. But are they sustainable as well? Because if you link the discourse on the cultural commons with the discourse on the natural commons. You have to talk about sustainability in another way than um, sustainability means get funding, right? <laughs> this is something we are really, really worried about and the peer production scene is not very concerned with the team. So we try to bring it together and to say peer-to-peer -to -peer -to production is a great thing if it is linked to sustainability issues because only then you can avoid taking resources from other people's comments. Yeah. Maybe one more question if anybody has one before we move on. Um, just a quick one um, you know, because you brought it up uh, the taxpayers' money being in, in projects and then to be to be open afterwards. Um, is, is it really the case in every single um, occasion? Because I can think of, of cases where taxpayers' money has produced results that are interesting only for a fraction of, of the economy, for certain very specialized companies, for example. And should, shouldn't the state try to, to, um, to remunerate on this on the costs by, by charging those few? I mean, if it's interesting for all of society, I agree, then, then it should be open because it was paid by everyone. But if it's only for very, very specialized people um, of, of any interest. For instance, for instance? For instance, it's kind of, um, I mean, uh, like, like uh, certain data sets that are only interested, uh, interesting for, for pharmaceutical companies that have certain facilities that only those have. Um, would it be a good idea to then charge them in, in order to get back tax money? Uh, there are very different solutions on this. Usually this kind of issue comes up, pharmaceutical research and so on and so forth. And uh, you certainly know the discussion on alternative licensing, equitable licensing when uh, it comes to research for medicine. So, I mean, there's no such thing as a one-fits-all solution when it comes down to how to actually organize and build institutions. But what I was talking about, and I cannot do more in what was it, 15 minutes, is what is the kind of leading principle, guiding principle, main idea? For me, it's a huge difference if the main idea is sustainability means search for funding, sustainable funding, which is like frightening for ecologists, you know, or the main idea is sustainability means indeed and has ever meant don't take out more of the system that the system can reproduce. So the thing I try to do is to make visible those core ideas of the commons which work all over the world, but which at the very end you will have and that makes the commons debate so um, complicated or complex, put it, let's put it this way. Life is complex, therefore the common debate is complex. It is so complex because when it comes down to solutions, it's one solution in Bolivia, one solution in Peru, it's one solution for water, another one for it's so different. It's, it's diversity. It's all about institutional, technological, and legal creativity and diversity. But what for? So my only question was what for? Thank you very much. Um, and while we are setting up, I have uh, two quick comments. One, um, uh, sustainability equaling 
a business model for nonprofit for nonprofits it touches two of my favorite specialty pet peeves. Um, because I hate both sustainability and business models. Uh, the, the other thing, I, I just, on the, the CC uh, vision statement, I think it's probably not incompatible with uh, commenting, but we're facing California and probably are less skeptical of technology than a lot of people in, well, in the comments movement, so. Yeah, um, thank you for the invitation, first of all. And uh, when I heard first that uh, Silke would, be, would take the lead and talk about uh, the great vision of, and the great principles uh, below the commons, I was kind of worried whether my a minor, you know, I'm at a business school, <coughs> teaching management, looking at organizations, so it's, it's, it's very far apart. And I was kind of wondering whether this actually would fit into uh, this session, but that it's uh, and, and but after listening to what you 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 talk about, I think that I, I have something to contribute. Of course, very minor uh, uh, things, but actually, what I think what I'm going to talk about is about the commoning. The, if if we agree that commoning is necessary to preserve any commons, be it intellectual, I would even say in the case of creative commons, even if you cannot agree whether commons are necessary for creating growth, or commons are uh, just necessary to uh, reproduce uh, immaterial material goods. I think we can agree that in the field of intellectual goods, uh, we need to grow the commons, because uh, they are uh, really, in a way, creative commons is, the commoning of creative commons uh, requires growing the commons. So this was more commons that is possible in a sentence, I suppose. Uh, but what, what I'm going to talk about now is just to present three some thoughts on what are strategic perspectives for the organization Creative Commons to improve its commoning ability. And um, to start, I, I want to just very quickly mention why I think or what I think Creative Commons contributes to the Commons movement, why Creative Commons wait to put it in a short. And I think the most important uh, thing is, of course, to provide uh, the professional tools for digital commons. And, and having uh, taken part in these sessions uh, over the last days, of course, we all know there are limitations to these tools. There are pitfalls. We can't agree even on what licenses actually mean freedom and what not. But what I think creative commons, and that's I think the most important contribution to the commons movement at all, in general, is creative commons demonstrates practically that an alternative copyright regime is not only really thinkable, but it's feasible. You can, in a way, even today, you can experiment with business models, with production methods, with whatever, in the commons. And, and without the commons, I think this would be very, very much more difficult. Of course, creative commons is great at creating the brand. I think this is also what relates to the talk of Silke. This is what makes creative commons such a powerful ambassador for I think it's not trivial. It's not just because I'm in a business school I'm talking about brands. I think to have a brand is, uh, is really something that is able to get attention. And attention, that's the most the scarcest good. Uh, and, and I think that's really something Creative Commons is great at. And the last thing, and this is the one thing I, I'm, I'm going to try to add to is, I think Creative Commons is really, the, the, of all the Commons movements, the most global one. In a way, there, no other movement, at least in my knowledge, is correct if I'm wrong, has so many uh, local outposts, so to say, so many local affiliates, whatever, all across the globe, even Wikimedia, which is also very global, uh, as, a, uh, as an organization, Wikimedia is still uh, building up this, this power, this potential. So, um, this is what Creative Commons is great at. What, what nevertheless, could be uh, done better, or, or what, could, what further could the CC contribute? And I would say, really picking up this notion of this, this, this great uh, transnational network of affiliates, I think Creative Commons is, as, far, as of now, under using, under exploiting that potential. I really think you have this great network, but I think you don't make the most out of it yet. And so I, what I think what would be necessary is to develop a, a, a chapter strategy. I think Creative Commons could uh, 
put, uh, get more out of its network, it will invest in, in strategizing and, and in improving the, the, his uh, approach to, to chapter. Related to this is, I think, Creative Commons could then improve in terms of lobbying, lobbying for the commons. I think this is commoning, yeah? being an advocate for the commons. And then, related to that, this would also maybe improve the capabilities of Creative Commons in terms of consulting. I will go very quickly to uh, do these three points. So the first one, leverage the Creative Commons global network. I would say, and uh, we had a lot of discussion yesterday, whether it's right that uh, all the lawyers within Creative Commons spend so much time versioning, <laughs> wouldn't, it, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, aren't there better uh, uh, tasks for them to do? Uh, I agree, probably, there are better things, but I don't see yet these tasks develop. And I, I really think, I don't know, in, in Wikimedia, that's, something maybe you can going to that, but something that I think Creative Commons could learn from, from Wikimedia, and I don't know whether you already did this in this uh, global summit, is, but in Wikimedia, the, the chapters, they're having heavy discussions on what is the way, what is the basics, what is the, the, the minimum task, the minimum work that chapters, that's how uh, local subsidiaries in Wikimedia are called, um, what, what does a chapter have to deliver in a way? Yeah? This means also for Creative Commons, this would mean demand more from your local jurisdiction projects, but on the other hand, I would say, if you demand more, you have to support more. Uh, and, and so, again, you, have, you, have to, you can take, but you also have to give. Um, and so I think um, the second uh, thing related to this is, the first thing would just be define what could be tasks, what could be things the local chapters should do on a routine basis. But I, I suppose that may, might not be enough. And maybe a Creative Commons should think of a long-term growth strategy. Because what the, chap, what the, the affiliates were good for was to expand the Creative Commons networks work very quickly around the globe in a very short time frame. But I'm not so sure whether the same affiliate model is also best for growing the local outposts. And I think I would at least suggest discussing whether there, it would be necessary maybe even to switch to a kind of a chapter model as the Wikimedia um, organization has it. And this in turn hopefully would allow, and, and this is um, maybe the, the thing that most uh, goes beyond Creative Commons as a single organization. I put it on here, of course, Wikimedia is transnational itself. Free Software Foundation is transnational itself. But then there are several other, I would, I would call them local heroes. And, 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 I would, uh, and, and, and I think the, the, the local Creative Commons organizations often, even today, they cooperate already with these local heroes. But I think to, to improve that, it would also be necessary to, uh, to improve the, the local outputs and the local chapters. So uh, just, if not every one of you is familiar with those, Digital Element, Switzerland, uh, Open Direct uh, Analysis in Chile, I think. And uh, then there's also, uh, I have forgotten the name, in Argentina, but you know, there's all around the world, there are, there are local heroes that also work on similar issues. Okay, so the next ones are quicker, I can assure you. If you have a more lasting and I think a more uh, sustainable uh, local uh, strategy in terms of chapters, I think you can also acknowledge that Creative Commons is the attempt of private regulation by standards. And uh, for standards to get effect, to, to be more effective and to, to more effectively uh, regulate the commons or protect the commons, it's important to have third party enforcement. And what is third party enforcement? Third party enforcement means adoption of a large institution, such as the most important example being, of course, the MIT with this open courseware project as one large institution. But um, third party uh, enforcement can also mean uh, not only, as currently, uh, Creative Commons is working a lot with corporations, with collective society, with public knowledge institutions, all these are third parties. But I would say that there's even more potential on the local and, and very local level uh, to, for Creative Commons to lobby with municipal, with regional, with federal governments to change their uh, guidelines, for example, for cultural subsidies, to acknowledge that uh, if 
they give subsidies for works to be created that they, when they are licensed free, maybe they could, this could be, uh, they could give a, a bonus, of, a subsidy bonus. This is something that has been introduced already in some, in some places. And um, it could also mean to change the laws for publicly funded knowledge tools. This is also something we see at least in the field of science. And my last uh, point would then be to consult more. And with consult more, I, I think I very much like the session before I talked about it, uh, about uh, the non-commercial model. Uh, because I think it's very important. And, and also Michael Carroll in his op opening session yesterday, he mentioned in the beginning we thought Creative Commons was all about free choice. But in the meantime we recognized free choice is not everything. We need interoperability. And I think the, the one way to, to get closer to interoperability would be to officially endorse licenses together with communities. So, and, and I put just two examples up there, but there of course there are more. But in the open data field, for example, I have the impression uh, this, the, the standard license for open data is more and more becoming either CC0 or CC5. That's what, what, I, what I observe, correct me if I'm wrong. In the field of open educational resources, I have the impression it's either CC5 or CC5 share line. And I, I would say, why not think of really officially endorsing? So if you are, because now you just ask the guys on the homepage, what is your content? Do you want to allow commercial purposes? Maybe it would help to really endorse for certain categories of work, certain licenses, and really to make a strong case. If you don't use this license, you won't, uh, your work won't be able to be remixed with other licenses, with other works, with other data of this field. And I think Creative Commons could be much more uh, explicit in this regard to increase interoperability without changing the license. And as a very, very last point, and I'm, I've not made up my mind myself about that. Um, of course, consulting is expensive, especially if you go into the uh, into the field. If you in Germany, if you want to consult all local municipal governments, it's impossible for for Creative Commons, at least as it's right now, to do that. And and to and if you and, and I I was just thinking about it. And, and also yesterday, I think we had the discussion of conflicts of interest. And, and, that's, and I think that's not true, that's, that's very important. So it's not so easy for a local creative uh, commons to this project to say, okay, we set up a consulting service, a uh, consulting provided by CC, or we take uh, 200,000 uh, uh, euros per, per day or whatever. So I, I think it's not feasible for creative commons to do this it's, it's, it's itself, itself. But could it be possible to, in a way, certify Creative Commons consultants? So we don't take the money from them, but, but we say, okay, they have, in a way, they have made a training, they know what it's all about, and, we, and they have understood it. We certify, they know what Creative Commons is, and if they offer the services, we, we grant them a, a certification for that. So I'm just thinking of a good example. I, I hope Mark to respect it, is not killing me, but for example, in Germany, you think in communications it's it's firm, but why not? Uh, and it's now an affiliate partner. But uh, why not? Uh, there are other corporations too like that that would make perfect certificate, uh, certified CC um, uh, CC consultancy agency, whatever you want to call it. But I, I'm not sure whether that's an open road. That's just not idea like that. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, Really awesome presentation. People are thinking about the consulting idea along the lines of using open matching and things like that. So, um, does anybody have one burning question before we go on? Yes, it's very interesting. The, the last point is very uh, controversial. You know, and we, really, I think it should be very useful now to have a discussion about uh, yes, the question of the brand Creative Commons. We cannot use it. Okay, that is the point. The second point is, who will be the certificator of uh, CC consultant? Who? Uh, headquarters? <coughs> Mike? Or uh, who, who can uh, certify? Yeah, that is a, it's, a, it's not impossible, but we have to discuss. Just, I don't say that it's impossible, but we have really to think about in the next uh, years, I think, uh, of all this kind of uh, question you know, together. Yeah,
the presentation can get a bit more pertinent towards tomorrow. I think. Uh, not just one one sentence. I think also the, that this is something Creative Commons might learn from other certification agencies. I, I think uh, there, there's the first YouTube Council that is certifying organizations and corporations in, in terms of uh, wood and forest trades, and then there's you know more about this, I suppose. Uh, but fair trade, whatever, they're also certifying. So I think there, there, there would be a, a solution for that. Uh, hello. Uh, I have uh, never done this before. I'm going to read uh, a script I prepared beforehand for my interest. It's so good. So um, I should start by uh, making a distinction between CC the organization and the CC the license. I see this section is more about the role of creating karma, the organizations in the global karma movements. Uh, of course, one cannot talk about CC the organization, but I'm not talking about CC license. Uh, but I think it will be a uh, useful. Just an exercise uh, to discuss what CC the organization can do and should do uh, when not talking about uh, the CC license. So uh, CC the organization has its vision in realizing the full potential of the internet, uh, universal access to research and education, full participation in culture. Uh, but CC the license are just for copyrightable works. And I think there's a gap between what CC license content can enable people to do and what people can really do when there's a universal access to knowledge and cultures. I think CC should move forward to provide universal access to knowledge and culture. And I think this is what the Global Commons movement is about. Uh, my point is that there are tasks CC, the organization, can do and they should do for this universal access region in addition to the maintenance and the promotion of the CC license. Uh, there are three areas I would like to see CC organizations work on. Uh, the first is about uh, career advocacy. The second is about uh, content trust. The third is about uh, light data. Uh, let me explain. Uh, career ad advocacy. Uh, CC, the organization, should make it clear that it opposed to action that obstruct the universal access to knowledge and culture. In particular, when people abuse the CC license, CC should make it clear that it does not approve of such abuse. Uh, for example, uh, a big company is making a deal with National Library, its citing public domain books. And this library agreed to that big company in imposing certain restrictions to access to the digital goods. Uh, is such a trend align with CC's universal access vision or not? Another example, a company running a photo hosting site has offered to mark a person's upload a photo at CC license. But the site also offered to remove CC license information when the person who uploaded the photo wants to switch to an exclusive license deal arranged by the company uh, with the third party about this photo. Uh, is there this um, abuse of CC license? So as a comparison, uh, one can look to the Resolve Foundation, which not only provides a DMU general public license, but also make tiny commentary about the free software, about software freedoms. Uh, they criticize people and the company when they do seeing the wrong ways. Uh, they are not afraid of making enemies. Why CC has, the organization has many friends. So should CC the organization see itself as the equivalent of the free software foundation in promoting the universal access to knowledge and the culture or not? Uh, content trust, we love Wikipedia and the Internet Archive. Uh, not only their contents or service are free, uh, we can depend on the two, the two non-profits uh, to always provide them for free. Uh, these are content trust, uh, this is my turn. Uh, they are managing uh, content collection and 
trust by the contributor, and the user so that the contents in the collection will always be free. A CC license work by comparison, it's just a single object uh, made really available by an action from an individual. A content trust, on the other hand, is maintained by a community of people with practice of sharing. CC should work closer with existing uh, content trust to further advance uh, this practice, uh, which is certainly go beyond public license. So here is just a thought. How about CC collaborating with free photo in, as in a free software community in forming a photo trust? Uh, this will help reduce the risk of CC license abuse I just mentioned, which is occurring just now. Uh, further, if people establish this photo trust using CC license photo from its inside, I think this community also get a very good exercise in forty and start reading the content collection. Uh, like data, uh, we know that data is big today. <laughs> big data drive big business, and the access to data is essential for our understanding of the world and the where we are now. Uh, some of the most interesting data is continuously produced by we the people, but we do not get to use them. Social interaction data is being collected in time, in real time. Uh, this large social data, in my opinion, is a common. But even CCGO or the public domain one do not adequately address issues that are related to access to that data. <coughs> uh, currently, uh, most usage of this live data is detected unilaterally by turn of service, and uh, there is not much. Uh, Quality of service to speak up. So I think it's very important for CC to work with live or quasi live data community like the open stream map to have a role in this new arena. Uh, VSS2 and the reuse of public sector information is a similar area to read into. But I, I feel like it's more urgent to learn from the grassroots uh, data community about existing uh, practice and uh, emerging issues. Uh, let me conclude. I think CC, the organization, need to play a more active role, make tiny and the clearly position standard, help build a content trust, and keep up with the live data issues. Uh, in my view, are uh, the three areas CC should work on in order to have uh, an important role in the global power movement. One last paragraph. If CC the organization only act on maintaining and promoting the CC license, but not, not much more, then one will need to worry about people leaving the CC memory, as the CC the organization may be seen as not working on important emerging issues for its self proclaimed regions. On the other hand, CC the organization has its great strength in its international level of education project team. And this team has been centering on the CC license. So if CC, the organization, play a more aggressive role in the common movement, then one will need to worry about what are the objectives and the tasks to further align the action of these global and diverse objective teams. I think this is a difficult question to ask myself. But nevertheless, this is a question I should now be asked. Thank you very much. Do we can we can take one question and then we have to let go. Or okay, let's just go with Kat. We can take questions. Yeah.
Ah, uh, sorry, not very good at that. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a little bit about how Wikimedia turned from just a project into a movement. So it's always dangerous to give a talk to an audience who knows the topic as well as you do, and particularly since I recognize many Wikimedians in the office of uh, uh, Wikimedia in the audience. Uh, I'm sure that there will be many people who are looking and shaking their heads and that's not how it really went or uh, different opinions on this. So, and that's the nature of our little community. So, how many of you consider yourselves part of the Wikimedia movement? I, should, I hope the chapter people are raising their hands, otherwise we've got a real problem. <laughs> but it should be more than just the chapter. So. And I don't think that that would have been true in the past. So, uh, Wikimedia, the Wikipedia project really, it started out with some great ideas and ambitions, but it didn't explicitly set out to define a movement. It was started in 2001, uh, a little while before Creative Commons came into existence, such that we weren't even using a Creative Commons license at the time. And it was just Wikipedia and just English. It was the experimental sandbox, for those of you who don't know, uh, for a, an also freely licensed but much more restricted editing process encyclopedia called Newpedia. So as an experiment, they decided to open up a, set, a section for public contribution. And as it turned out, that the experimental section was much more successful. At the end of its existence, new media ended up with about 25 articles. Uh, the Wikimedia projects were about to hit 20 million in all languages and about 11 million media files. So I think the experiment was a success. I don't know about the original project. But no one was ever using the term the Wikimedia movement until about 2008, at least not in a way that stuck. And I was kind of amazed when I was going back and looking to see when that happened. It was as late as 2008. Uh, the idea was a lot to, to Florence de Boer, who is the former chair of the Wikimedia Foundation. Uh, she was the first community elected board member of the foundation. And before anyone else was really thinking in terms of the movement, uh, her uh, first candidate statement was talking about those ideas, about creating a revolution, about changing the world. But nobody was using the term the Wikimedia movement. It was a project, and it was a project with some big fingers, but it wasn't a movement. So, she was also one of the driving forces behind expanding the community from a very English-centered project to an international one, so it's perhaps fitting that she was the one who first popularized the term of referring to as a movement. Oh, I'm not protecting it, so I, I don't want to protect it. <laughs> so otherwise, I'll have to make my notes. I'm not, going to see the, I'm not going to say much about Jimmy, first of all, because everybody saw his face for about two months this past year already, and we've probably heard enough about him. And secondly, one of the most important things that he did to enable the movement was to get out of the way. And not to insult uh, what he did already. Uh, one of the most important things that he did was to decide to make Wikipedia from his personal project into a foundation, and not a one-man project, to develop power so that a foundation can take control, to step down as chair, to take an evangelist role, but not so much formal leadership, not to be one man in charge of the project, because one man couldn't be in charge of it. So, when Florence introduced the term, the Wikimedia movement, she made it in a post about communication, talking about the way Wikimedia was communicating with the world, that what we were presenting to the world didn't really reflect what we were. The talk about the Wikimedia movement was kind of scattered. You could see people putting these, uh, putting a few thoughts on internal wikis or on mailing lists. But if you went to the Wikimedia Foundation site itself, you would have no idea that there was anything beyond the project. You would have trouble figuring out that it was a community. So she posted some ideas. Why don't we create a new site? Something that will summarize what's being done by the Foundation and chapters globally. It would welcome pages such as listening speaking events uh, done by Wikimedia people, or press interviews that uh, various organizations involved with the movement have done. And it could explain, in the simplest terms possible, what the roles and responsibilities of each of the organizations involved was. It could be a place where people could collaboratively build a description of the movement, and where we could list actions that we were taking in furtherance of it. Her post was uh, talking about the separation of discussions, how that was uh, making it very difficult to, to have a movement if people couldn't find out about it. So, it wasn't in our messaging, and it wasn't how we thought of ourselves. And this was seven years into our history, 2008. By this time, we were already one of the top ten websites in the world. We had brought in $6 million to do whatever we did with it. 
But what did it mean to think of ourselves as a movement rather than a project? We had to keep thinking about that. The change in our mission statements from 2005 to 2008 reflects how we started to change uh, the way we thought of ourselves. Uh, and in 2005, we had a mission statement. And it described the Wikimedia Foundation as dedicated to the development and maintenance of online, free, open content encyclopedias, collections and quotations, textbooks, other collections of documents, information and databases in all the languages of the world that will be distributed free of charge to the public under a free documentation license, and so on. It goes on for about another two paragraphs, which is far too long for a mission statement, and it's kind of dry details about the things that we were doing. A description of the project, not a broad vision. When we revised the mission statement, it was clear that we thought of ourselves differently. The mission of the Wikimedia movement today is to empower and engage people around the world to collect and develop educational content under a free license or in the public domain and to disseminate it effectively and globally. The collaborative efforts of various groups around the world provide the essential infrastructure and framework for the support and development of multilingual wiki projects and other endeavors which serve this mission. It doesn't really mention the dry details of running a project now. It describes more of an ambition. It describes infrastructure. It describes tools to create knowledge. It doesn't specify the details of which license to use or where the foundation is located. So we've changed, as we've changed the mission statement, we've changed the interpretation of what it is that we're doing. It's become broader and more inclusive. When you're building a project rather than a movement, creating a resource is the goal, and changing the world is a dream. When you're reaching over 400 million people, creating a movement means getting all of the people whose lives are enriched in some way already to understand how your values already make their lives better, how adopting them and extending them can improve everyone's experience. Florence had hit on a job feeling looking for a word, and it wasn't long after that post that we began a strategic planning process similar to the ones that Creative Commons is uh, about to embark upon. Unusually for a strategic planning process, we tried to be as participatory as possible. With the new conception of ourselves as a movement, it became more important to identify goals to focus our resources for direct action. We've never as a community suffered from a lack of good ideas, but we have suffered from a lack of focus. Where do we put all that great power? If we're a movement, how do we figure out what we do with that momentum? So one of the consultants helping us with our process uh, described, the, described the process in a blog, and because this was very unusual, uh, the Harvard Business Review uh, did a whole series on our strategic planning process because it was so unusual to have people participate. And he was going to say, we're trying to figure out where Wikimedia should be in five years. That question is hard enough, but there was an even harder question that we needed to answer first. Who is we? In order to figure out that question, we used professional help and internal staff and uh, people in the community, stakeholders, to use a little bit of management to speak, as many as possible. And it turned out that over a thousand people from the community, uh, from the wider community, not just editors, participated in helping us figure out what it was that we were doing. One part of turning from a project into a movement is figuring out who the community is. The traditional conception when we were just a project was just the people who contributed directly to the site. We had 300, we have 300,000 authors, but we have about 400 million readers. And we're not just one community, but many. Not just users, not just editors. It, it tried to expand the definition to include educators, users, donors, fellow travelers, people who've never made an edit, maybe people who even barely use the site are part of the Wikimedia movement. We have over 30 national and subnational chapters, over 500,000 donors. People are using it in their classrooms and putting it on low-cost laptops for kids. They're not ed they may not be editors, but they're part of our movement. One of the major outcomes of our strategic planning process was the movement goals working group, which started to find what it is to be part of the movement. And I came up with a draft chart which had some things, what do you have to be to be part of the movement? They all share common beliefs, values, vision, and mission, the same ones that the foundation adopts. Each group, a movement group, can set its own goals, but they must be in harmony with movement with priorities. They, open, they must operate with maximum openness and transparency to the movement and share information as peers, making an ethos of self-regulation be open to anyone who can contribute to the goals, share the commitments to diversity and non-discrimination, and shouldn't hinder the work of others who are working to advance the common goals. 
Now, trying to figure out how everyone does that is a little bit easier, uh, is a little bit more difficult than it is to try and figure out what it is that we're aiming for. And I expect the chapter's people in the audience here will certainly identify with that. So, thinking of ourselves as a movement. So, the goals of the strategic planning process itself came out with a set of five goals that reflect our changed identity. We wanted to improve reach, content quality, participation, infrastructure, and innovation in a way that was in part of those principles. Each goal came along with its own small report, some practical actions, and some ways to measure success. In talking about those goals and how to achieve them, it was not just top down, but with the movement in mind. Some practical effects. Conceiving of ourselves as a movement meant moving from the online world into the offline world, not just developing the projects but establishing offices in new places where we weren't yet, where we didn't have very much reach. Establishing labs and libraries and universities and doing workshops so that we could connect with people where they were already. Um, we started incorporating chapters into fundraising, trying to be more conscious of the potential of many decentralized organizations and reaching outside ourselves for expertise. Changes the way you think about priorities. Decisions about fundraising are no longer do the books balance them. How does distributing money in this way align with the roles and responsibilities each of us have in the movement? We should have control of it. What should the chapters be doing, and what does it mean for them to be part of the movement? Thinking of ourselves this way meant trying to figure out how to communicate effectively within it and devote resources to it, and we now have several staff whose main job it is to be a liaison between groups. How do we research into ways that people are contributing outside simply editing? Another way it changed our priorities is uh, reinforcing the importance of being inclusive, diverse, and vocally. We realize that we can't fulfill our mission simply by focusing inward. A little bit more of directed growth rather than just organic. Everything that was easy to do has almost already been done. The way to fulfill our goals now is more directed growth. What hasn't the organic method of achieving our goals been doing, and how can we devote resources to correct that? When you talk about a movement instead of a project, you stop thinking about the Wikimedia Foundation as the center of everything, because one foundation isn't going to scale, and scale up. You have to think about how to make your community, because being part of a movement means that we're not entirely in control of it anymore. The control gets further and further from the center. One, from one project to many, from one organization to many, from one language to many, and then one community to many. We're not there yet, but we have some idea of where to go. And finally, being a movement means recognizing the vast amount of potential you have for change. A movement has real power, and not using it is also a choice. And when you have that much power, it's irresponsible not to use it for change. The responsibility of being a movement is recognizing what you have, considering its effectiveness and how it contributes to the world. And in order to focus that power, it's important to define principles and goals, what you're working toward, and what it means to succeed. One of the most valuable tools that Wikimedia has for effecting change is the goodwill built around what we do and what we stand for. And to echo Leo's term, well, what we have is our brand. Mentioning Wikipedia is recognized. People know what it does and more and more what it stands for. It's the sort of thing that's possible under the world that we want. From the outside, a creative common seems to me to be the most visible brand in the space of creating the infrastructure for openness and freedom. You mentioned creative commons, and people have associations with it. Recognize that the things that Creative Commons supports are the things that further that association. And they'll rally behind it where they wouldn't for things with less built up goodwill. Wikimedia and Creative Commons both benefited when we had our license transition and changed to using a Creative Commons license. Uh, creative Commons got more visibility in the world, and Wikimedia was part of the openness movement that Creative Commons has stood for. I want Creative Commons to consider itself as a focus for a movement, the way Wikimedia has begun to consider itself as a focus for a movement. And I'm looking forward to seeing the outcome of the Creative Commons strategy process and the portfolio license process. And I hope that it will involve many, and hope that it will involve many of the people who consider themselves stakeholders in their community in order to best reflect what the priorities of the movement should be. Thank you. Thank you very much. I love how everyone's talk reinforced. Um, I, my guess is that people, we might be still be running late and have time for a couple of questions. So I see one in the back. Actually, go ahead. Oh, okay. So, should we open up the floor for questions? 
This one's for Cat uh, specifically. Uh, I am curious what your thoughts are as opposed to, uh, um, on uh, how well CC is currently handling being a, um, a community rather than just an organization and what we can do and how we're failing at that also and how we can do it better and et cetera. So uh, as someone who isn't a local affiliate, it's always been difficult for me to figure out how to participate as a member of the Creative Commons community rather than just the broader free culture community. Uh, certainly I do things that promote openness and as part of the Wikimedia project we support things that Creative Commons does. But I've never figured out really what it means to be part of the Creative Commons community. And I wonder if Creative Commons is thinking about making that more clear in the future, thinking of ways for people to really become part of the Creative Commons movement rather than a group of free culture advocates who like the Creative Commons does. Okay. Uh, maybe we can take one more question while people are setting up or filtering in. Sorry. Uh, Claudia. Hi. Uh, more than a question is a comment, uh, just to follow up. Uh, our friend from Korea. Um, in the last session, when we had this same uh, group, we actually uh, discussed about the role of the Creative Commons uh, license at the Creative Commons as a whole. Um, and what we discussed about that uh, was very interesting because uh, what we talked was about uh, how Creative Commons has become more than a movement, than a tool. And the, the question is how can we actually understand that change? And uh, what we discussed in the last session was about, uh, at least in Latin America, for instance, the Creative Commons movement had been very, very, very involved in the copyright reform process. And I think this, uh, this, uh, this is a, a very important tension between the Creative Commons uh, as an uh, American organization and Creative Commons as a global movement. And I am truly believer that uh, Creative Commons has become more a movement than a tool, than a legal tool. I mean, the legal tool is quite important, of course. But the importance of Creative Commons now is, a, is the importance as a tool to create and promote global change. And the way that we can actually help to that is just providing these tools, but taking into account, especially, our importance as a global movement. And I think this is a very important point. I think we're going to have to continue that discussion tomorrow, but um, it reinforces the point, certainly, that Beth Cat made. So thank you, everybody, for who was here the whole time to, uh, for attending. Thank you very much to the speaker.